On this episode of The Source, I'm here at the Bay Area Maker Fair, one of the largest gatherings of maker enthusiasts in the whole country, over 85,000 attendees this year. On this episode, you're going to see interviews with uh, people that actually run the Maker Fair. You're going to see uh, bolts of lightning shoot across the screen. You're also going to see uh, huge boulders suspended from the air. So all that and more is coming up on this edition of The Source. R2, what do you think about this year's Maker Fair? I'm Aaron Newcomb, and you're watching The Source. I'm Granny Mahara from Mythbusters, and you're watching The Source. I'm here with Zach Coffin, who is the creator of this, uh, uh, probably the largest exhibit actually here uh, at Maker Faire, which is just behind us here. You can see the spinning rocks on this very large metal structure. And uh, Zach is the creator of this, and so I pulled him aside to ask a few questions. Zach, thanks for joining me. Of course. So uh, first of all, um, the, the question that everybody always asks, right, because we've been standing over there listening, everyone comes up, how much do each of those rocks weigh? Well, the rocks weigh about 10,000 pounds each, and uh, I figure there's about 45,000 pounds spinning. So that includes all of the rigging and everything above the rocks? Yeah, all the steel and the head and, and the spires and, and all of that are about 45,000 total, right. give or take. A few thousand. Right. So I also noticed that there's um, you know, some ropes coming off the bottom, and the kids are just having an awesome time trying to spin this thing as fast as they can. Um, but you know, there's so much there's so much weight, they really can't spin it too fast, can they? No, we're, we're pretty much limited by the strength of a, of a human and the maximum running speed of a human, and that's a human running in a circle. So there's, there's some real limiters on how fast it'll actually end up going. Right. Now, what was the most difficult part about building the structure itself and, and putting it together? Was there, a, was there something that was uh, uh, more challenging than, than other aspects? Um, it's, you know, we, we built it in 2005 for Burning Man, so we worked out a lot of the problems. And we, d we designed it in CAD, and we spent about six months in, in CAD designing it. So it, it's pretty straightforward steel, steel work. It's, it's bolt connections, and it's about rigging. and. I wouldn't say it's easy, but it's it's not a particularly complicated piece. To, it takes time, but it's not. It's right, so bolts, welding, things like that. Um, okay. It's not too complicated. And then how does it actually rotate? I mean, there's got to be some, some bearings or something at the top that actually allow it to rotate around. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, well, originally we had a, a slewing bearing, which is a bearing used for cranes and, and uh, when you man lifts and stuff like that. And uh, the, the bearing accidentally got scrapped when it was in storage. So. I ended up buying, uh, I mean, building a new bearing, and I designed this one from scratch to try to reduce the friction, and, and I think it was pretty successful. It's a, it's a definitely a little less friction, um, and this bearing is a design that I came up with uh, over the last couple of years. I designed it in SolidWorks, fabricated it up, um, and so it's, it's basically a set of rollers and um, and hardened steel raceways. So friction's got to be obviously the biggest, the, the, the most, the thing you have to come, overcome the most in this particular thing. Yeah, well, there's friction and then there's initial startup torque because you are getting 45,000 pounds spinning, which is, you know, the weight of a, an average size house. Right. So once they do get it spinning, it's pretty, pretty darn hard to stop. Yeah, though there's a lot of, there's still a lot of friction in the system, so it does come to a stop, you know, relatively quickly. Okay, and then there's also this other exhibit that the kids are fascinated with behind us, the spinning rock here. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, it weighs about 9,000 pounds, and uh, I have a, of a bearing uh, anchored into the rock at the exact center of, of balance, so it's exactly balanced. And uh, the bearing is, uh, is leveled up very precisely. I used, um, I used machinist grade equipment to, to bring the, the bearing into exact level. And uh, as, soon as, you, uh, as soon as you get those two things in, you know, in a line, then it becomes really, really easy to spin it. Now, the bearings are, it's all custom machined, and um, we've got, you know, thrust bearing on top and then a radial bearing holding the shaft in, in, into alignment. So it, it, it makes it really easy to spin it. So, and it's, it's basically just a lot of fun. Yeah, exactly. The kids... It's a big dumb rock, you know. Yeah, the kids are having a blast. I mean, simple things. Talk about my kids when they were young. The things they liked the most were the simplest things. The cans, the, the pots, the pans, whatever it was. They seem to really like spinning these rocks around. So one of the most simplest things you can imagine, and yet they're having a blast doing it. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think that all of us, you know, from a pretty early age, 
we really understand the weight of a rock. You pick up a rock, it's heavy. You try to move a big boulder and it doesn't move. And when you encounter you know, a 9,000 pound rock that you can push with one finger, I think it's, it's really a whole new experience. And to me, it's really about teaching. It's really about, you know, like with the right technology and with the right technique, you actually can move a 9,000 pound rock. It all depends on how you approach the, approach the problem and, and the tools you use to, to solve that problem. Right. Well, I think that, uh, you know, kids' imaginations are, are um, really going crazy. The fact that they can interact with the exhibit, I think, is, is what makes it really special. Not just that it's there and it, it looks cool, right. but the fact that they can interact with it is, is really, really neat. Right. So where can people go to find out more? If they want to find out more about these exhibits or other exhibits, is there a website they can go to? Yeah. My website is uh, uh, www.zacharycoffin.com. It's coffin as in casket. And Make It Fair has a bunch of stuff up on it. And um, there's, there's quite a bit of press out there. It should be pretty easy to find. But right. zacharycoffin.com is my website. Okay. Thank you very much, Zach. I really appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Hi, this is Grant Imahara from Mythbusters, and I am a maker. I'm here at Maker Fair, Bay Area 2011, here to check out all the new ideas that are happening. And uh, i got to say, I've only been here for about 10 minutes, and already I've got a million new ideas. All right, I'm here with Joe DePrima. He's one of the creators of Architect and uh, the show that actually uh, uh, stars Electricity. Electricity is the star of their show. Um, and they're here at Maker Fair doing an exhibition and it's really, really something. The crowd's going nuts for it. So I asked him if he wouldn't mind stepping aside and uh, talking a little bit about the technology behind the exhibit. So Joe, thanks very much for talking with us. No problem. All right, so um, how did Architect get started? How, how long have you guys been doing this and how did it all come together? Well, I guess uh, we've been doing this since 2005 and uh, you know, what we do now is pretty elaborate and it didn't happen overnight, that's for sure. So like when we first started doing this, it was kind of like a hobby thing that we kind of did in the evenings and weekends while we were working our day jobs, you know, and we built our first solid state Tesla coil probably uh, in uh, November of 2005. And that was our first musical prototype. And uh, we took it to an art show uh, that March and it was our first show we ever did at the Enchanted Forest in Austin, Texas. And, uh, you know, we had like one or two songs or something like that in a machine that wasn't exactly reliable. It was like <laughs> that tall, you know, it made a spark probably that long or so. But it was a lot of fun and everybody got into it. And, you know, it just kind of became one of those things where we were always trying to make it bigger. We were always trying to make it better. And then, uh, you know, we would start doing more shows. Eventually we were requested to show up at places. Uh, we had some YouTube videos that got popular and some... Uh, uh, you know, after that, you know, after the YouTube videos took off probably is when we started getting booking requests. And uh, it just kind of keeps getting bigger and bigger, you know. Right. All right, well, um, it's obviously very popular here. You've, you've actually taken some audience members out of the crowd and put them inside this uh, cage behind us and, and actually um, had the whole show going with them inside and that's been um, pretty popular. Are you ever concerned uh, in doing that? Obviously, I think the science is pretty pretty sound as far as electricity is concerned, correct? Yeah, absolutely. And we're totally confident with the safety of the Faraday cage. It's not like the first time we've used it and it's not like we put audience members in there right off the bat before we understood that. You know, and so we've literally had thousands of people through that cage and we've never had a single incident. You know, it's pretty much like imagine being inside the cage is probably safer than being where we are right there just because it's a Faraday cage, a block CMF, you know, and so uh, I'm not worried about it in the slightest. Yeah. Even still, they do sign a waiver. So uh, just in case anything happens, everybody's covered. Now, uh, one thing I did want to ask you is, how in the world do you, are you able to produce sounds and control the sounds 
um, um, that come out of these gigantic Tesla coils sure. to actually produce uh, music. Right. Well, I think the most important thing to understand is these things aren't exactly Tesla coils. Like from the primary up, the primary is that copper spiral at the bottom. They are identical to a Tesla coil, but the thing that sits in the magic box down there that drives it is completely different, and it's more similar to probably a computer power supply. It's a big series of digital logic chips and transistors, and so we actually use a computer to interface with that circuit board, and we use that to uh, control when the Tesla coil turns on and off. All right, so we have a little microcontroller that accepts MIDI data and say that we want the Tesla coil to play an A at 440 hertz. What we do is we turn the Tesla coil on and off 440 times a second. Every time it turns on, it makes a little pop. You take a series of those pops together, say 440 of them in one second, it's gonna produce an electrical arch, an arc that has the pitch of an A, right? And so that's basically the simple version of how we do it. The more complex version takes weeks and weeks to explain. Right, right, but that's actually not very, very different from how the human voice works, right? I mean, or how a, uh, it is electronically, but I mean, uh, many musical instruments, if you slow them down dramatically, uh, you kind of get to what you're talking about, where, you know, uh, if yeah, you... Exactly, well, it's all just about creating sound pressure waves, like the speaker moves back and forth, right? Now, what we're doing when we're creating an electrical arc is we're actually displacing the atmosphere, right? We're, so we're superheating the atmosphere, and that's how we're creating the sound pressure waves with the electricity, you know, as where a speaker will just resonate it by pushing it back and forth. We're kind of doing the same thing. Right. But just in the open air, yes, exactly. right? In the open air. Right. Now, I noticed you got a keyboard, um, and there's also some drums over here, and it all seems to be tied in together. How did you manage that? Absolutely. Well, the keyboard, we don't use it as an instrument so much, but we actually use it as a music sequencer, and it outputs MIDI data to all of our instrumentation. And so the drum set is actually a robot, and it has a uh, MIDI controller, and it was built by an architect member from Austin, Texas named Craig Newswinger, and uh, it's pretty much like a... Uh, kind of like a pinball machine. It's got a bunch of transistors in it and it throws levers, right? And uh, each drum has a hammer with a rotary solenoid and the MIDI controller takes the musical data, the MIDI data, and it tells the controller when to hit the drum and how hard, right? And so we just send it a beat like we would send a drum sampler or something like that, like the exact same code, except we turn it into a real thing. Um, and so, uh, one more question I had for you. I mean, this is obviously one of the most, I would say anyway, one of the more popular uh, exhibits here at Maker Fair. What kind of feedback have you been getting from the audience and uh, um, you know other people here at Maker Fair? We always get great feedback, and uh, especially at Maker Fair, but you know, just about anywhere, just because the thing, the installation just demands so much attention, right? It's like, you know, our installation is similar, like imagine you're in the middle of the city and you see an elephant walk down the street. Everybody's like, oh my God. And we kind of get the same reaction. And so it's pretty much like a, a bug lamp for people. How long does it take you to set something like this up? Uh, you know, it all depends on how big of a crew we have. Like to do an installation like here at Maker Fair, we took a whole day. We kind of took our time, made all their cables neat, et cetera, et cetera. If we're in a super hurry and all we got to do is turn the Tesla coils on, we can do it in 20 minutes. Great, great. Well, Joe, thank you very much. Uh, where can people go to find out more information about Architect? Architect.com. All right, can't be much easier than that. Thank you very much. No problem. All right, bye-bye. <laughs> there we go. We got it. It looks good. Absolutely. Thanks. Thanks. All right. I'm here with Brian Jepson, uh, who is the say it say it again. What are you? The uh, editor of the Makebook series. Editor of the Makebook series, and uh, he's here. Actually, I found him in the Maker Shed, talking to people about all sorts of interesting uh, uh, microcontrollers and 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 books for sale and all kinds of stuff. So uh, glad you could join me today. It's a pleasure. Thanks a lot. All right, so um, I had a question for you. Obviously, my podcast is about open source, and uh, it's also about making things. I do a lot of hacking on devices, taking things apart, things like that. 
Um, how do how does open source software and uh, this idea of making things how do they come together? Where how do they intersect? Well, they you know they intersect a lot of ways in the the effects that you see. Open source in software has always been really great at fostering community. Makers have always shared knowledge with each other, shared skills and shared techniques, and the truth is makers have always been pretty open source. And now that we have so many places where hardware and software overlap, such as the Arduino microcontroller board, it's just a natural fit because it's really what both parts have been doing all along. Right, and I know that, um, uh, for example, just recently, uh, Google announced that they were going to be, uh, one of their um, uh, reference devices was going to be an Arduino uh, controller that they were going to use for uh, some of their uh, uh, software that runs on Android. And uh, I thought that was a really good way to showcase, look, here's a here's some basic, essentially open source hardware, uh, and also some software to control it that runs together, and there's actually a major company um, um, using it. Are there other examples of companies using uh, open source software in kind of a uh, to help developers and things like that. Is there are there some companies that you can think of that are that are working along that front, or is Google really a pioneer when it comes to that? Well, you know that's a that's a, a great question. Google's move to base their design for their reference board on the Arduino Mega. Uh, I don't. It's it was quite stunning and thrilling. And I don't think I've seen anything quite on that scale. Uh, now that said, you can just walk around uh, Maker Faire and you can see large numbers of companies uh, that are here that, that are embracing that in, in some ways. Uh, I mean, even the company uh, that makes the um, chip that powers the Arduino, if not for the fact that their chip works so well with GNU C and you know they've got folks working for them who worked on the uh, you know some of the some aspects of, of those development tools you know really uh, you know really helps for to build this kind of open source ecosystem around a piece of hardware if something as simple as your hardware works well with a C compiler that works on all three major platforms Mac Windows and Linux but you can even take a company like Microsoft which had a thing called a spot watch a long time ago it didn't really take off but it had a really interesting piece of technology and it a very stripped down version of the dotnet framework and microsoft took the bold move and put that under the apache 2.0 license and right now in the maker shed uh there's a product in there called netduino it's not an arduino but it's shaped like an arduino and it has uh, a compatibility uh, in terms of the pinouts and uh, uh, can work with a lot of the same shields as the arduino but it uses a completely different environment but it's all open source uh google's uh, Google's step was very bold, very big, very public, uh, and you know, given the context of how other consumer electronic companies have typically approached accessory development kits, uh, this is a, a huge departure. For example, with Apple, you, you need to become a partner before you can develop a hardware device that works with, with an iOS device, whereas now with, uh, with Google, anybody who knows how to program Arduino can do it. So. Right, and there's a lot of references out there, obviously, for people to go, um, uh, uh, you know, you can get an Arduino, you know, readily, obviously, like you say, a lot of the a lot of the devices and things here at Maker Faire this year are powered by Arduino or use Arduino. There was Arduino, I think, over a, a, a number of Arduinos over um, in the, uh, um, I forget which pavilion Expo it was. Hall. Yeah, yeah, the Expo Hall. And, and little kids were there learning how to solder, learning how to make lights come on and go off, and I think That's it was right. great. So uh, there's an educational uh, uh, aspect to this as well. If, uh, you know, it's fr if it's easy and free and, 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 and available for people to get their hands on, um, it makes it a whole lot easier for people to learn as well. So what's next in this, um, in this sort of space with open source software and, and uh, people making the communities kind of seem to be coming together? I've noticed a lot of people walking around with uh, uh, open source related shirts. Creative Commons is here. Um, you know, so there seems to be this, uh, uh, it seems to be growing, the two communities seem to be growing together. Uh, what's kind of next on the horizon? What do you see happening in this space? And, and where can people go to learn uh, learn more or maybe just learn more about the, the uh, books that you're producing? Sure. 
Well, I think we're going to see a lot more, uh, let's call it peanut butter in your chocolate, kind of like the Android Arduino combination where people are going to realize that these devices, these technologies, uh, can be combined in, in, in ways that are uh, really l larger than than you know they're 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 the, in, the you know the, the, the sum ends up being much larger than they are individually, um, and so I'm really hoping that Google is going to be a um, an example for other folks. I would love to see Apple follow their lead. I would love to see Microsoft follow their lead. And as far as following us, the best place to learn about Arduino from us is maketeam.com slash Arduino, and that'll lead to a number of blog posts and other resources. And we also have makezine.com, where you can find links to blog posts and so forth, and makeshed.com, where you can find all the kits and books that, that we've created and hope that people enjoy and hope that they'll lead to people creating great things. Right, great. Well, thanks for your time. It's, it is important to point out that even though we're standing outside of Makershed now, uh, Makershed is actually an online resource as well, uh, where That's people right. can go to, to buy Arduinos or buy, buy kits and make things, and there's a lot of really cool stuff there, so definitely check that out. Great. So, well, Brian, thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Aaron. It's been a real pleasure. So, we are Spark Fun Electronics. Uh, we're an electronics company that designs uh, boards and tutorials and uh, components for your average DIY electronics enthusiasts. And um, we really like to focus on creativity and being able to, to make your own electronics projects at home and try to share what we know uh, with the community and be part of the community at the same time. Um, so today, we are here uh, teaching soldering workshops. We have uh, kids and adults coming in to do plated through-hole soldering. Um, and we've got about five or six kits where you can come in, sit down, and in a half an hour, put together your own electronic toy. Um, and we are based in Boulder, Colorado. We started, what, 2003 in a dorm room. Uh, and we've grown from a dorm room to a company of about 115 people in about uh, since then. So today at the fair, we've brought a sample sampling of all of the products we sell. Um, basic microcontrollers, basic sensors, um, LCDs, any component you would want to make uh, a cool project. And we've also brought um, a couple of fun projects that we did just for the fair, which are the uh, big uh, tactile Tetris board um, that is all full color RGB LEDs and plays Tetris. We've also brought um, our FM spectrum board, which is 100 FM radios all put together to show the signal power of the entire FM spectrum. So you can look at one board and see all the signals on the FM radio spectrum. Um, we've also brought our vending machine, which we just had made. Uh, we were asked by several colleges and hackerspaces to make some sort of uh, machine that could sell our products without having to wait the week that it takes to get them by ordering them online. So we've got that and it's brand new and, and it's working and people seem to enjoy it. Uh, if you'd like more information, we are at uh, sparkfun.com. We have our full catalog online as well as great tutorials and forums to get you started on whatever you're working on. All right, so I'm here with Sabrina Merlot, and she is going to uh, talk a little bit about the history of Maker Faire and what's going on this year. So, Sabrina, what's your role at Maker Faire this year? I do maker relations. <laughs> I also am a producer. I produce the content on the, cent uh, the center stage and the innovation stage. Okay, great. So it sounds like you're pretty busy then. There's been a lot going on over there. It's, a, it's very busy. We have a bigger program of, of talks and presentations than we've ever had. Right. Well, talk about that because, I mean, this is my first year at Maker Fair, but I have uh, been uh, following it, obviously, closely, and it seems like this is really busy this year. As far as attendance, do you think this is going to be the biggest uh, fair so far? For certain. Yeah. Yes. We, we probably... Uh, Maybe could have fit 20 more people in here yesterday. <laughs> yeah, it was really, really busy. I was here uh, both days getting interviews and things, and it was just jam-packed both days. I mean, you can see behind us people walking by, and it's uh, 
uh, almost too busy at times. You feel like you can't can't get in to see because there's so many people that are so excited to see the exhibits. Do you have any idea how, as far as attendance goes, do you have any estimates for how many people attended this year? Well, we know it was about 85,000 last year over the two days, so we know it's more than that. We, it's only estimate at this point. We don't really know. We'll know tonight more. Okay, great. That's a lot of people. A lot of people. I mean, I, I, you can tell by the traffic when you come in and you try to park. It's just crazy. It takes a while. You actually have to plan. If you've never been to Maker Fair, plan to get here early uh, so you can get some parking because it does take a while to, to or, find a parking spot. Or figure out how to take the train or bring your bikes on your car and pedal in, and then you avoid all the lines and get discounted tickets. Absolutely. In fact, I, that's what I was, <laughs> I was just telling my family. If I had thought ahead, I would have brought my bike yeah. or several bikes, and we could have biked here. Um, so tell us a little bit about Maker Faire. What are the exhibits that people are seeing? I mean, obviously, you know, uh, Arc Attack has been really big this year. Um, Adam Savage was here uh, earlier uh, and gave a talk, and there's been talk by many people. So what are the, what are the uh, exhibits, and what are people really interested in seeing this year? Well, Maker Faire really spans this incredible range from art to technology, engineering, science. We've got a new Health 2.0 pavilion this year about people having you know, open source access to managing their health. Um, so, you know, there's some real exhibits that draw people over and over again. There's the fabulous pedal powered rides of CycleSide. There's the mouse trap, uh, this, you know, live full scale, you know, larger than life reproduction of the old mouse trap game. Those are some of the sort of, you know, hit hits the cornerstone of Maker Faire. Uh, but then there's there's a surprise around every corner at Maker Fair. So one of the lovely things is you might see some old favorites, and there's probably 40% of the makers this year are new, which is great for us as we grow that we're getting so many new exhibits, people doing new robotics projects, a lot of Open Connect stuff this year because of the that that phenomenon that occurred this year. Um, so. There's plenty of things. Right now, there's a lot big presence from the Young Makers program this this year as well. Some really great exhibits of kids making uh, pulse jet engines and, you know, water totters, teeter totters that pump water. And that's been a great sort of addition to the fair is more kids showing. Right. And that's something I certainly noticed uh, this year is there's really a lot of younger, you know, families here and, and, and children and um, they're really, really engaged. And that's one of the nicer things about almost all the exhibits is that they do, uh, it, it, you don't just crowd around and watch. Uh, children can actually participate, like with the Colossus, you know, you can actually spin the, 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 um, the, 15, the pounds of yeah, the rocks around. <laughs> I mean, that is tremendous because it really gets kids involved and then gets them kind of started on their path towards making things. Um, now you also run uh, East Bay Mini Maker Fair, right? And uh, I believe you just kicked off some planning for that. So talk about when that's going to be. Sure. Well, we do the East Bay Mini Maker Fair in October. This year it'll be October 16th in Oakland, California. Um, and the Mini Maker Fair in Oakland is just one of many that are happening actually around the world. We're having a workshop here tomorrow morning on how to make a Maker Fair. To some extent, we've, we've open sourced Maker Fair and are encouraging community-based organizations who have this interest in showcasing the makers in their community to put on a Mini Maker Fair. It can be five makers, you know, it could be a hundred makers. Uh, but the, the, we're finding a lot of momentum, and you can find some of that information on MakerFair.com. Now, any advice you can share with people that might be watching that weren't able to attend? I know you said there's a workshop uh, here uh, for folks that want to get started, but if people weren't able to attend and they want to get started, any, any uh, uh, one or two quick uh, pieces of advice that you might offer for folks? Get together with your friends, have a little dinner talk about it and see what maybe some wine some wine definitely <laughs> wine really helps especially when you're thinking about engaging in a big project like throwing an event <laughs> right you might need some lubrication but really it's it's a wonderful way to build your relationships with your friends and get to know new people if you're interested in this community you know you might meet beekeeper beekeepers that that blow your mind or some you know a neurologist who's experimenting with prosthetics hand prosthetics or something right if that's the beauty of maker fair is it's it sort of expands this uh, community that's really fundamentally uh, about lifelong learning, about being curious for your whole life and continuing to learn. Right. Well, that's something that I know my wife uh, remarked on as well as is, is how much of a community feel there is here at Maker Faire. Everyone is happy. Everyone's getting along. Uh, you know, people are picnicking out on the grass here. Of course, this is a great uh, location, but uh, you know, people are just having a real good time and it's, it's really enjoyable. Even though it's crowded, people really aren't stressed out. So anyway, 
except when they pass in front of the camera. That stresses me out, but anyway. All right, well, thank you very much for uh, sharing with us today, and uh, please pass our thanks on to everybody at Maker Fair. It's been a wonderful experience for me and my family, and it uh, looks like it's a great success this year, so thank you very much. Thanks for having me. All right, well, that'll do it for this episode of The Source. Until next time, I'm Aaron Newcomb. Keep watching The Source. Sarah's a fool, she's 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 a fool, she